Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. There are very few articles which are relevant from your civil services examination point of view. And one is on page number 5 of the Delhi edition of The Hindu. It talks about GSAT 29. Now, Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, on November 14 is going to launch this GSAT 29 into the orbit. Now, what is this GSAT 29? It is basically a communication satellite. And this communication satellite is to be used for high quality internet services. And this will provide digital communication in very remote areas. For example, in Jammu and Kashmir, in Northeast, where there are village resource centers to provide digital communication capabilities to these village resource centers, to provide internet access to these village resource centers, this GSAT-29 will play a very important role. But what is the launcher that will be used for GSAT-29? It will be India's heaviest GSLV Mark III that is going to lift this satellite into the orbit. And on November 15, when this launch will be a success, then we will have an elaborate discussion on GSAT-29. So that is one thing that you will have to keep note of. Now let's look at another news on page number 10 of the Delhi edition of the Hindu. It talks about Simbex. And what is Simbex? Simbex is an annual naval exercise between India and Singapore. So it is basically a bilateral naval exercise involving two nations, India and Singapore. When was it launched? It was launched for the first time in 1994. And now the 25th edition of this India-Singapore bilateral naval exercise that has begun in Port Blair. Now from civil services examination, we also need to understand one more thing. Last year, India and Singapore signed an agreement. And that was basically a logistical agreement. And what is the significance of this logistical agreement? Basically, Indian ships, they will get access to Changi Naval Base. That is in Singapore. So if Indian ships require refueling, if Indian sailors require replenishment, food, etc., they can dock at this Changi Naval Base. So that's a significant relationship boost in the ties between India and Singapore. Now let's analyze some of the editorials and columns from today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with the crisis deepens. Now we have discussed the Sri Lankan political crisis two times in the past. We know President Sirisena has dissolved the parliament and now he has called for fresh snap elections in January. And now the elections in January will determine which way the wind blows in Sri Lanka. But many people argue that President Sirisena's decision to dissolve the parliament is unconstitutional. How? The 10 years of Mahinda Rajapaksa, when he was the president of Sri Lanka, many people argue that it was an authoritarian regime. It was a regime which was against the people of Sri Lanka, particularly against the minorities, Tamil and Muslim minority in Sri Lanka. Now, when Rajapaksa was defeated by Sirisena and the alliance of Sirisena with Ranil Vikramasinghe, then the government in 2015, they passed a constitutional amendment in the parliament. And because of that constitutional amendment, the powers of the president were curtailed, were restricted. Now, the president of Sri Lanka could not have dissolved the parliament without the majority of the parliament. Unless and until two-thirds of the total membership of the parliament requests the president to dissolve the parliament, president does not have the power to unilaterally dissolve the parliament. Now, he has done that. And many people argue it is unconstitutional. But the president's office defended the decision of the president to dissolve the parliament on the ground that president has the power to summon the parliament, president has the power to prorogue the house of the parliament, president has the power to dissolve the parliament. But the Hindu editorial says that since the constitutional amendment made it clear that president cannot dissolve the parliament without the request by two-thirds of the members of the parliament, then this decision of the president is unconstitutional. Now, what this editorial basically talks about 
it talks about that since the opposition in the Sri Lankan parliament has approached the judiciary, now the ball lies in the court of the judiciary and judiciary has a crucial task at hand to safeguard the constitution. So Sri Lanka is at a crossroads where it has to make a crucial choice between democratic consolidation or a retreat to authoritarianism. The same authoritarianism which was promoted without any opposition by the then president Mahinda Rajapaksa. That is what this editorial is all about. Now let us look at another column, We Should Be Free. And this column has been written by George Morton Jack. George Morton Jack is the author of well-known book, Untold Story of Indian Army in the First World War. Now, the First World War began in 1914. It ended in 1918. And yesterday in London, the world leaders celebrated the culmination of the First World War. But many people don't know that the Indian soldiers played a heroic role in the First World War. There were close to 15 lakh Indian soldiers who fought the First World War. But how they were treated, what is the role played by these soldiers, not many people know about them. Why? Because if you look at the soldiers of Britain or France or other First World countries, after they dropped their guns, they picked up their pens and they wrote glorious memoirs, glorious books about their own experiences in the First World War. For example, Winston Churchill, who later on became the Prime Minister of England, he wrote one of the best-selling memoirs on the First World War. Similarly, Sasson, he also wrote beautiful account, beautiful account of his personal experiences in the First World War. But since the Indian soldiers were mostly illiterate and poor, they could not write these glorious memoirs about how they felt during the First World War. How were they treated by the Allies in the First World War? But how do we know about these Indian soldiers of the First World War? Basically, we know about their experiences through the letters that they wrote to their family members back home. But here lies the catch. Since most of these members were illiterate, so they did not write their letters in their own hands. Instead, they used the army scribes and these scribes wrote the letters on their behalf and these letters were then sent to their family members back in India. But most of these letters, the author argues, most of these letters were censored. That means those references about the mistreatment of the soldiers, they were omitted from these letters. But then what happened in 1970s, there was an American historian, David Illinwood. He interviewed a large number of last surviving Indian soldiers of the First World War. And he came out with a big manuscript, big transcripts of the conversations he had with the Indian soldiers. And then through these transcripts, we come to realize that Indians were deprived of their rights. Indians were flogged by the British. They were paid less than their white counterparts. They were segregated in camps on trains and ships and they were barred from the senior command. That means basically the promotional opportunities were available only to the whites and the Indian soldiers were discriminated even though they were fighting the same war that the whites were fighting. And that is what this column talks about. Now we should depend upon the oral history. That means since not much is known about the Indian soldiers who fought the First World War because they were not literate enough to write their own memoirs, to write their own books, we should heavily depend upon the oral history through this oral communication that these soldiers had with the fellow Indians, with the historians, and we should document them. And this is what George Morton Jack talks about. I hope the transcripts showing the veterans' true feelings can finally be made publicly accessible in India. Now let's look at another column, Riding the Tiger, written by Kanak Mani Dixit. There are elections to be held in Bangladesh and in all likelihood, Sheikh Hasina, who is the head of Awami League, she is all set to win the elections if, if everything goes as per what opinion polls are suggesting. The column talks about Bangladesh as a whole. So Bangladesh is not what it was in 1971. 
1971, when Bangladesh emerged as an independent nation, it was clubbed with a group of countries which were categorized as basket case. That means useless countries of the world. But from this basket case, Bangladesh has made glorious advances. And now Bangladesh is all set to enter into a group of middle income countries. Bangladesh no longer is making news for mass deaths from famines or cyclones or floods. And Bangladesh is way ahead of its neighbors such as India and Pakistan on various human development indices. For example, life expectancy, maternal and child mortality, rural poverty, food security. Bangladesh is much ahead of India and Pakistan. But now what this column talks about and from civil services examination point of view, we need to understand the Indian connection. When Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who fought for Bangladesh independence, when he became the Prime Minister, then in 1975, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was assassinated. Together, his wife, his sons and other family members were also assassinated. Two daughters of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Sheikh Hasina, who is now the Prime Minister, and her another sister, Sheikh Rihana, she was offered refuge by Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And that speaks volumes about why Sheikh Hasina is tilted in favor of India today. That means the relationship between India and Bangladesh, which is the biggest success story coming out of Prime Minister Modi's diplomacy. That means if we have to pinpoint the biggest diplomatic success of the current government in Delhi, we can safely say it is in Bangladesh that Modi's diplomacy has succeeded. And it is because of this reason that India and Bangladesh shares very good relationship with each other because Sheikh Hasina is the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And Sheikh Hasina has now been supported and applauded by the world community. Why? Because Sheikh Hasina provided refuge to Rohingyas who were fleeing Myanmar because of ethnic cleansing that was going on in Myanmar. She is also supported by the world community because she is standing up against the Islamic fundamentalists, against the Islamic extremists in Bangladesh. But particularly, Sheikh Hasina is lauded in India. Why? Because she dismantled the terrorist camps in Northeast. She dismantled the terrorist camps who were acting against the Indian sovereignty in the Northeast. That is the biggest success story coming out from Bangladesh. But now in Bangladesh, we see crisis as well. There are people who are saying that Sheikh Hasina has now turned into an authoritarian leader. She is arresting the critics. Recently, the parliament passed a law which restricts freedom of speech and expression in Bangladesh. Fake encounters are rampant in Bangladesh. But that is not our concern. From the civil services examination point of view, if a question on India-Bangladesh relationship is asked, we have to be absolutely sure that Bangladesh is the biggest success story in Prime Minister Modi's diplomacy. But many people in Bangladesh ask if we have dismantled terrorist camps that were hoisting a war against India, what have we got in return? Because increasingly there is a demand from Bangladesh that we should get some water sharing from the Tista River. But Mamata Banerjee, the West Bengal chief minister, she is blocking it. And Indian government is also not in a position to assert itself and allow Bangladesh to share the water of Tista River. That is what Sheikh Hasina would need so that Sheikh Hasina can go back to her people and tell her that this is what I got in return. If I have dismantled terrorist camps who were acting against Indian interests and this is what I've got in return, the Tista River water. That is what the government should focus on so that the hands of Sheikh Hasina are strengthened when she goes back to the people of Bangladesh for another term in office. Now let's look at another column on page number 9 of the Delhi edition of the Hindu. Can Trump roll back the Persians? Now we know that Donald Trump has withdrawn United States from Iran nuclear deal or the deal which is popularly called as Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This Iranian nuclear deal was the signature diplomatic achievement of the former President of United States, Barack Obama. But now what United States has done, it has pulled out of this Iranian nuclear deal. 
who were the other partners of this Iranian nuclear deal? Basically, P5 plus one nations. Five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which includes United States, Britain, France, Russia, China, plus Germany, who is not a permanent member of United Nations Security Council. All these other countries, barring United States, they have decided to stick with this deal. They have decided not to withdraw from this Iran nuclear deal. But so far as the companies are concerned, the private institutions are concerned, they fear that if they still continue their business dealings and transactions with Iran, United States is going to impose sanctions on them. That is why Italy's ENI, this company has withdrawn from business dealings with Iran. Similarly, Germany's Daimler, it has also announced that we are planning to pull back from our projects in Iran. Similarly, France's Total, this company has also decided to pull back from projects in Iran. Now it's going to be a challenge for Donald Trump and it's going to be a challenge to Iran as well. How? Let's try and explain this. When in 1979, Islamic revolution broke out in Iran where the Iranian extremists they captured the political power in Iran and a pro-western head the Shah of Iran was deposed by the students in this Iranian revolution of 1979 then immediately afterwards Iraq which was headed then by Saddam Hussein attacked Iran from then onwards the Iran's position was that we will have a new doctrine going forward and that new doctrine was called forward defense doctrine what is this forward defense doctrine Iran wants to expand its influence in the Middle East but in Middle East we have two other powers as well one is Saudi Arabia the other is Israel Israel is a nuclear power Saudi Arabia is an ally of United States but what Iran is doing five times the defense budget of Iran that is the defense budget of Saudi Arabia Israel already has a nuclear power it already has one of the most formidable military all over the world so the balance of power is tilted in favor of Saudi Arabia and Israel in the Middle East now what Iran is doing Iran is pushing for this forward defense doctrine and what is this forward defense doctrine Iran has supported Hezbollah in Lebanon it has supported Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria it has supported the Houthi rebels who are basically Shias in Yemen so basically Iran is trying to expand its influence not militarily but through its proxies through its allies in the Middle East and that is how it is expanding its influence so what this column basically talks about is that there are two options available with Iran Iran can either also pull out of this Iranian nuclear deal and then start enriching the uranium for its nuclear bomb if Iran does this then United States will be proven right so the assumption that United States has that Iran is also developing a nuclear bomb this assumption will be proven right in the world community that Iran is actively pursuing its agenda of manufacturing nuclear weapons so Iran should not do that instead Donald Trump this column says should have used this Iranian nuclear deal to pursue Iran that you should cut down on your forward defense doctrine you should not try and expand your influence in the Middle East because Saudi Arabia is pressurizing United States Israel is also pressurizing United States that you should have withdrawn from this Iranian nuclear deal because through this Iranian nuclear deal Iran has strengthened its economy and Iran has strengthened its resolve to expand its influence in the Middle East so what this column basically talks about is that United States should have used this influence of Iranian nuclear deal to pursue Iran that you should cut down your desire to have a strong influence in the Middle East politics but now since Donald Trump has withdrawn from this Iranian nuclear deal it remains to be seen whether Donald Trump will succeed in endeavor to roll back the Persians or not that is what this column is all about now let us look at some of the prelims based questions from today's paper which of the following statements regarding Konak temple 
is or are correct the temple is made up of granite no it's made up of stone the temple is often referred to as white pagoda no it is referred to as black pagoda white pagoda is the jagannath puri temple in odisha it was placed in the unesco world heritage site in 2017 no it was way back in 1982 when konark sun temple was placed in the unesco world heritage site so none of the above statements are correct which of the following is geographically closest to great nicobar it's sumatra let's look at the map it is sumatra which is geographically closer to the great nicobar island not colombo not java not borneo if you look at the distance distance from great nicobar to sri lanka is 1437 kilometers while as the distance from great nicobar to sumatra is 1192 kilometers previous year's question paper If you travel by road from Kohima to Kottayam what is the minimum number of states within India through which you can travel including the origin and the destination the answer is B7 how this is Nagaland Kohima first state will be Assam then it will be West Bengal then Odisha then Andhra Pradesh then Tamil Nadu then Kerala so total there are seven states if you travel by road from kohima to kottayam and which are these states again kerala tamil nadu andhra pradesh odisha west bengal assam and nagaland let's look at the mains based question answer should not be more than 250 words what is the question a lot more needs to be done in terms of protection and localization if india is to use the resource of data effectively in the future There was a time when people would say that world is fighting wars for oil. Now it is increasingly told that data is the new oil and tomorrow the world will be fighting for this piece called data. There are many people demanding today that the data related to Indians should not be stored in the servers outside India but should be stored locally within India. Now let's look at the answer. Recent reports suggest that there are more than 500 million internet users in India currently but only 38.5% of the population has access to the internet the number of users is second only to china that means if more and more people will have an access to internet then this number is surely going to rise every person with a digital footprint is a source of all manner of data For example if you use Baiju's the learning app if you use Amazon Flipkart Facebook Twitter you all will leave your digital footprint and this digital footprint is the source of all the data that we have data modern wisdom has it is the new oil and india has lot of data with much more expected to be added to the mines as more and more people get online how we deal with this resource will determine our place at the international table in the near future it is time to pay serious attention to how this data is to be protected and where this data needs to be stored as things stand today data is collected from individuals and this data is owned and manipulated by the companies that collect it and that is how this acronym is widely used today called gafa google apple facebook and amazon they control the majority of the data in the world a lot of this data that is privately held can be used for governance and public policy purposes for example you use your ola or uber or you use google maps this data can provide key insights into how people in cities travel and how can we develop solutions for making travel easier but since this data is owned by a private company policy makers researchers they have no access to this data but this kind of personal data can be used also for surveillance can also be used for monitoring purposes where you go which countries tickets are you booking what are the assets in your bank accounts all this data can be used to keep a surveillance on you as well if this data is not effectively regulated it is here that we require a strong data protection and localization laws 
creating a responsible set of rules regarding the mining, owning, sharing and processing of such data can help regulate this incredible resource, use it better and protect the privacy of the citizens as well. While large technology companies have often argued that steps such as data localization, where the data should be stored within the country only, should not be stored somewhere else, this will restrict free trade and that cross-border data flows are vital for the modern economy. If you are asking GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook to store the data in India, not to store Indians' data outside, they are saying that it goes against the free trade. It goes against the idea of free market economies but it is very important for the government to prioritize the security and safety of the data of their citizens and we have to prioritize the safety of the data over the profit of these multinational companies there was recently a report by bn Krishna about the data protection RBI has also issued guidelines for all these financial technology companies that you have to store the data of Indian citizens within the country. This is in the right direction. This is the step in the right direction. But a lot more needs to be done in terms of protecting and localizing the data if India has to use this resource effectively in the future. That is how the answer to this question should be. That is it from the daily Hindu newspaper analysis. Thank you for being with us. Have a great day.